Hey everybody, Jamie here from Game Show. I'm gonna do a real quick thought on this week and I wanted to um, address some of the things that have been happening around Nintendo and its relationship to YouTube. Um, for those of you who don't know, Nintendo rolled out a program which would allow YouTubers or offer the opportunity for YouTubers to become um, essentially paid brand ambassadors um, and receive a rev share, um, basically a, a portion of the advertising dollars attached to a video um, that featured Nintendo content. And there's still, I guess, working on exactly you know how much needs you know how much content needs to be explicitly for Nintendo regardless Nintendo decided to try to make money from people who in the past were just putting up let's play videos and criticism videos and other things um, totally for free and obviously people are not very happy about that um, well it turns out today or in the last 24 hours Nintendo has announced that um, the program has become incredibly popular and they've been overwhelmed with submissions um, a couple things here, because I think we want to take a broader context, as it's always important to do when we're talking about these types of issues. Um, the first is that you know copyright holders are already finding myriads of ways to work with not just YouTube celebrities, but it could be Vine stars, it could be um, people in other mediums, people work on, you know, people, I'm sure people will start developing content for Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, it's, I think it's important to understand that this stuff already happens, um, that these types of relationships in which a company decides to pay someone um, for exclusive access or the ability to release something, again, it happens all the time. Nintendo is just making this process open to the public, um, which is really, really unusual. Usually, you know, brands are often more selective about who exactly it is that they want to work with. But again, this is something that already ha happens on YouTube. And the other thing is that there already exists programs like Content ID, for example, for the music industry, which allows YouTube um, to algorithmically figure out where a particular copyright holder's song is being played and then drive the revenue, the advertising revenue that's attached to that video directly to the creator, not to the creator of the video. Um, so again, I, I mean, we should be prepared for these types of things to happen. I think that, you know, video games, I think fortunately, as I mentioned in my video, my video about uh, copyright and let's play, I think video game creators have been very, uh, very lucky and very forward thinking in terms of taking a much looser view on what copyright is. And obviously it's a very different thing for let's play videos. But again, go back to the video um, that I produced about that. The other thing is the this argument, one of the complaints is that Nintendo is potentially shooting themselves in the foot because they get free exposure. This is the argument that PewDiePie is making, um, which is that you know companies like Nintendo benefit tremendously from people making videos with their own content. Um, so the example that's often brought up is Minecraft, uh, that Minecraft kind of started as this tiny game, which was launched on the TIG source, uh, TIG source message boards and then became this huge international phenomenon in large part because of Let's Play videos. But it's kind of a chicken and egg problem there in that is Minecraft popular because Let's Play videos helped push it up or vice versa? Is Let's Play as a medium popular because Minecraft was the right title um, for those types of experiences? It's really hard to say. A lot of the arguments about um, sort of influencers' relationship to exposure uh, comes from Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, which is this idea that if you give a small group of uh, influential people uh, or who are people who are influential in their circles um, access or the ability to sort of promote something, then that will sort of trickle up and affect everyone. But there's not a lot of clarity about how exactly that works in large part because the web is a crazy and mysterious place. So you should understand the reason why this is important is because at a lot of big companies, there are two individual departments that a lot of times they fight with each other. You have the marketing department on the one side who's responsible for uh, getting out, uh, getting a particular product out to the public as wide an audience as humanly as possible. And the other side, you have the legal department. It tends to be like obviously way more conservative. Their job is to protect the brand. And a lot of times in this new era where there's so much um, content being shared, those two departments butt heads all the time. And you see this, for example, in the music industry with music bloggers in particular, where the marketing department wants to give music bloggers, um, you know, leaked tracks or sort of encourage the promotion of music freely through the web and the legal department's like no that's ours we paid for this uh, we should find ways to monetize it and these two departments are always butting heads the problem is it's very difficult to say which side ostensibly makes more money does it um, does obviously having wide levels of promotion 
wide levels of promotion, um, drive sales, and that's what's really important, or would it be better to try to establish legal channels to collect on every single dollar? Uh, and I think that part of the future is figuring out what the balance between those two worlds is. And I think that that's essentially what you're seeing is Nintendo trying to sort of work that process out. They acknowledge that um, YouTube creators, um, that YouTube creators um, are people who are obviously very passionate about Nintendo, but they also realize that this is their property that they've paid to develop, that they're already paying the market. So they want to figure out ways to sort of benefit, um, co you know, sort of collectively benefit from the popularity of their videos on YouTube. One last thing, um, I think the most interesting part about all of this is, uh, the most interesting thing about all of this is the sort of end around that Nintendo is doing uh, in terms of more traditional channels. They already do this with Nintendo Direct, which is their press conference that they do online. You know, they'll have presence at you know big conferences like E3, for example. Um, really what they're doing is they're trying to create their own direct channels to the public to release the video in the most favorable fashion as possible. And they're tying dollars to that process. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this doesn't become the norm, not just for games, but for all types of things, for beauty brands that you know want to capitalize on other you know fashion and style blogger uh, vloggers and bloggers. Um, that, you know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see more of these sort of like official systems where a company says, "Look, we get it." Uh, we get it, you want to use one of our products, why don't you become an official ambassador? We get 30%, you get 70% or 60-40 or whatever the split may be. Um, the thing that I don't really understand is why Nintendo is signing themselves up to review millions of hours of YouTube videos to figure out what's a registered, what should be a registered channel and what shouldn't be, but I don't know. I guess they'll figure it out in the process. Anyway, that's my thoughts on it. Uh, I'm not sort of coming out you know, in favor of Nintendo saying that this is the right thing to do, but I do think that it's incredibly important to think about this in the broader context in terms of how other mediums, not just games, are dealing with these types of situations. I'll see you all next week.